all right in this video i want to encourage you to do good works and what do i mean by good works i mean to actually obey god ask god to reveal to you what you need to actually repent of and clean up in your life that you can be a good witness for him that you can be a bright light pointing to jesus that people look at you and they see that's a Christian. I'm encouraging you to do this for a few reasons. And not just to do that good work, but to go out and work for God as preaching the gospel, teaching the word of God, whatever God is putting in your heart to do for him, do it. And of course, help the poor and the needy the widow, the fatherless, those in the hospitals, those in the prisons, those that need your help and that you're able to help, help them. Show the world that you're a Christian. And it's very important to be doing this, especially now. And I'm going to tell you two reasons why. One is that when I talk to people and I'm giving them the gospel, a lot of the people I give the gospel to are actually Christians. They claim to be Christians anyway, but they don't actually know the gospel. You teach them the gospel and you tell them Jesus Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and rose again the third day. That when you truly believe this in your heart, you are born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You are saved. It's a done deal. You cannot be unborn. You can't be unsealed. And if you are be able to be unborn and to be unsealed, there is nothing to show that you can be born again again and resealed. There's no talk of that because nobody can lose that salvation once they have it. But that doesn't mean to go live how you want to live. Because not only will you be chastised in this life, and lose out on heavenly rewards. But you make it harder for the rest of us to actually reach people. Like if you were just being even just lightly lit on fire for Jesus. Where you just took care of your family. You did your job at work. And you know you, you didn't do anything outrageous. You're a good example to your community. If you were, if that's how you lived, then that's that's great because then there's people like me who are talking to people who are, for an example, a Seventh Day Adventist, who believe that we are under the law and that we need to keep the law. And if we at least try our best to keep the law, then we can't be saved. So when I talk to them about the gospel. They hear, you can do whatever you want and be saved. You're teaching to be just sinful and to live lasciviously. And they start talking about preachers and other Christians who believe in grace and they just live pretty worldly. So when I talk to them about the gospel, they don't see me. They don't see my life. They're judging my message based on everybody else who claims to believe that message and preaches that message. So it hinders the message getting out because of your life, because of the way you're living. And if all you did was, like I said, you just took care of your family and your job. You just did your part in your home your neighborhood, your little community, this wouldn't even be an issue. You don't have to go be a missionary and be going door to door. You don't even have to be doing that. Just come out of the world. Let the world know that you're a Christian. Because of your actual example that you're giving, you're hindering the message getting out. 
if we actually pulled together and we prayed together, prayed for one another, and came out of this world, there's nothing they could use as an excuse to reject the grace. There's nothing. They could see that all the people who believe the gospel are changed. And that would be a message in itself. That would be a witness. And that would win over others. But not only that, but times are changing. I don't just mean, you know, time goes along. Of course, times change. But I mean times are changing as in the dispensations changing. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back soon. And he's going to take his church. He's going to take them up. And I know there's a lot of you Christians that don't believe in the rapture, or at least a pre-trib rapture. But it's coming, and it's going to happen. Grace is going to be lifted. And I don't mean that there's not going to be any grace, just like the Spirit coming up. It doesn't mean there's not going to be the Holy Spirit around. It means that you're not going to be saved by grace through faith. You're going to be saved by works plus faith, like it was under the law. You're no longer going to be born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit. You'll be anointed with it, which means you can lose it. And in order to receive the Holy Spirit and to keep the Holy Spirit, you need to be walking with God and to let go of this life and to overcome it. And I don't mean to live in sinless perfection, but be striving for it. You need to come out of that. Because if you don't, the Holy Spirit can leave you. And then you'll have no power to resist the temptation, to resist the Antichrist, to resist the mark of the beast. This time is right around the corner. And we as Christians are set an example to the world of what Christianity is. And we're living very worldly. So when we get raptured, they're going to remember your life. And they're going to think, well, I can do what they did. And they're going to follow that example. Right? Because actions speak louder than words. And because of the example you gave, they're going to think that they're going to be able to do the same thing and keep the Holy Spirit. But we are in the time of grace. Not like it was under the law where they were anointed with the Holy Spirit, we are actually born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Right? This is changing. And you need to stop thinking about yourself and running after Trump, trying to make this world a better world and making America great again. Who gives a shit? We're all going to die anyway. This whole world is going to be destroyed. And we're going to have a whole new one. Stop clinging to it and start worrying about your soul, the soul of your family and friends and the soul of all those people out there that you could have an influence on. You, you pick up your life right now and you get closer to God right now. That alone, just letting the world know you're a Christian can be a, one amazing testimony when you get raptured. Because then they'll think about how you conducted yourself, how you talked, how you responded to things, and how you ran your family, how you were at work, how you were at school, how you were in the community, going out to the, the games that you bring your kids to, to play t-ball and flag football and all that stuff. How you conducting yourself and letting everybody know that you're a Christian, and then when you're gone, then that could be what actually saves them. Your actual testimony. Right? So I I just wanted to, to get that out there so that even if the rapture is a year away, seven years away, 50 years away, If we change our lives, we can get through to people. And if the rapture is really soon, 
showing that we truly believe the Bible, we truly believe God, we truly believe the gospel, then we can reach people. Because there's these people, like I mentioned, the Seventh-day Adventists as an example. Catholics are quite similar, where they believe in their works. And they look at Christians like us, and we're living worldliness. We're being sinful and selfish and thoughtless of others and inconsiderate. And that's the example we're putting forth of Jesus and the gospel. That's what we're putting forth to them. And then they're like, well, I'm actually trying to please God. And even though they're trying to do it for themselves and to save themselves, they see your life and they think, well, why would I believe God's with them? Why would I believe there's anything to what they're saying? I think it's just their interpretation. I think their interpretation's wrong. And they're just going to go into their lives because at least they are actually trying to obey God and to do good works. Now, they think that that's going to save them, which is wrong. But at least they got something there that is actually a stronger testimony. Like if you have a non-believer come into a group and a group of Seventh-day Adventists and there's a group of gospel-believing Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists aren't saved, but they'll look at them and say, well, they got their act together at least, right? They got something there. We're looking at these gospel-believing Christians and they're worldly. To them... They're going to be more drawn to the actual fruit, even though the fruit is from selfishness, of trying to save themselves. It's not out of actually loving God and loving their fellow man, which is what I'm encouraging you to do. You're saved. You don't have anything to worry about. So do this out of love for God, because God would be so happy if you actually influence somebody else to be saved so they can spend eternity with him. You'd make God very happy to, if you did that. Not only that... You would make other people happy, right? If you got them saved by being an example and shining light to them to point to Jesus, they'd be forever grateful. Right? You, you do this for God. Do this for others. Right? That, that should be a great motivation for you. It's what the people like the Adventists say they're doing. The law is about loving God and loving your fellow man. Even though when you preach the gospel to them, they'll say, well, then you're preaching lawlessness and to sin. And it's like, well, I thought you loved God and loved your fellow man. So why wouldn't you obey God out of that love you're talking about? Here you're trying to save yourself and you say it's love, but it's just self-love. Right? So what we need to do is to, to clean up our act. And I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of scriptures here. Like here, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 is usually what I bring up. But I wanted to bring up this next verse too. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right there is talking about salvation. You're not saved of your works or anything from you. It's a gift. It's grace. Grace is something you haven't earned. You can't de deserve. Works is something you've earned and deserve. Right? And it wouldn't be a gift because you paid for it. And you receive that grace through your faith, which is believing and trusting God. That's what you're saved by. You truly believe that God's for you, not against you. And that he paid for your past, present, and future sins on the cross. He died for you in place of you. That's your entire life. And you believe he rose it again because he is perfect and righteous. He didn't have to pay for his own sins. He was paying for your sins and leaving them in hell. That, believing that in your heart, not just a head knowledge of it, but truly believing in your heart, realizing that you are a sinner and you're condemned and you have no hope, you can't save yourself, and then you truly grasp on to what God has done for you and realize his salvation, that is when you're born again and when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, which is what we actually read in chapter 1, which I suppose I'll, I'll go to and come back to this. 
as we see right here, like I'm preaching to you the gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. I talk to a lot of these people and I ask them what the gospel is. I ask the Catholics, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, even to Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, what's the good news? What's the good news of the gospel? They can't tell me what it is. But they're supposed to preach it to the world, but they're not preaching it to the world. What they're preaching is become part of my church and to jump through our flaming hoops and hopefully you'll be saved. But like we see here in Ephesians 1, verse 12, it says that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And just to make it clear that once you're born again and you're sealed, you're sealed until you're saved, which means Jesus comes and redeems you. And you're no longer in this condemned flesh. Verse 30 of Ephesians 4 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. A day of redemption is exactly what we see going on in Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus is pulling the seals off of the, the scroll. That is the title deed to everything, to creation. Right? And that's when everything's going to be redeemed. So you're sealed until you are redeemed. That's a future event. So let's go back to chapter 2. And after it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, that the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you see how we are created to do good works. This is not saying do good works to be saved. If you don't do these good works, you're not saved. It's saying that's why God created you, to do, do good works. Right? And once you are saved, that's when you can actually truly do good works because now your motivations are pure. If you're doing good things, you're doing it because you actually love God because you appreciate what he's done, that you're thankful for what he's done, and you actually care about others and getting them saved so that they can know the love of God too and that they can go home with us and we can all spend eternity together. That's what's going on here. You need to be saved to truly be able to do good works because if you're not saved, you're breaking the law. The law is about loving God and loving your fellow man as yourself. Right? And... If you're not saved, you're doing it for yourself. You are trying to obey God and you're trying to do these good works to hopefully earn salvation. That's selfish. That's focused all on you. Every good thing you're doing is tainted. It's tainted with your selfish intention. But we who are saved that believe the gospel, we need to be as motivated as these people. They're doing these things to try to save themselves, and it's a burden to them. They're not going to admit it, but it is, because they're constantly condemned. But that's what's motivating. They're like it's a, that condemnation is whipping them to do better and do better. So they're doing these things, even though it's out of selfishness. We should have a a greater love for God and our fellow man than they do for themselves. So we should be doing more of this. Whatever we're able to do. I'm not telling you to just drop everything and go become a missionary somewhere or to sell all your stuff and give it to the poor and needy. No, take care of your family. Just come out of the world. If you are you drink, you smoke pot, you're into the worldly music, you dress provocatively, uh, all these other little things. You're, you're into all this stuff that you, you're you going out with the world doing their thing when you know it's just for your pleasure, right? It's not about anything other than that, your own entertainment, your own addictions, just pleasing your flesh. 
come out of it. At least do that and be an example. And I'm not saying do it under your own power. There's plenty of people that will pray for you. You can comment here and I'll pray for you. Pray for yourself to overcome these things, to be a bright light. Right? You put it before God and put it on Him to help you. He'll help you. I know there's times where the addictions to things used to be so strong and you didn't want to do it. But you had that feeling come up where you know you're going to do it. An example would be somebody who smokes or somebody who uh, coffee. You know, some people try to quit that or sometimes it's food, certain food you want to give up. Other times it's a little more serious, whether it's pornography or even something like heroin, something more, a little more hardcore. You know that feeling. Anybody who's been addicted when you're trying to stop and you're being strong, you're fighting against it, but you know that feeling that comes over when you just kind of forget about everything. You forget that God even exists. And you're just, I want this and I'm giving into it. And you know that it's taking over and you're going to smoke that cigarette, eat that food, do whatever it is, right? That's when you put it on God and you be honest with him. I want to do this selfish thing. I want to do this evil thing, this perverted thing, this self-degrading thing, this self-destructive thing. I desire to do it, and I want to do it, and I'm going to give in to it unless you do something. You put it on God. This will build your faith and trust in Him as He will help you. He'll provide a way. Lay it on Him. That alone, set an example, is good enough to be a witness. Now, if you're convicted to do other things, like what I'm doing here with teachings and videos and preaching, do what you God's calling you to do. I'm not going to tell you what other things to do other than to come out of the world and be a good example. I don't know what work God has for you, and I'm not going to say what it is, because I don't know. We each have our own little role. So anyway, some more motivation here in James chapter 2. At verse 5 it says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? So here, how I was first taking this is that because of their example, people were blaspheming the name Christ, Christian, because of their example. Right? There's people who are poor and needy, just as an example. It could be other things, like somebody just wanted somebody to talk to, just needed some company or something. You could help somebody out in some way, but instead you didn't. You know, like the Good Samaritan, a lot of people just kept walking by, and you as a Christian, and people know you're a Christian because you say it, but then you just kind of walk on by. Well, then those people, they blaspheme Christianity. They blaspheme Jesus because they see you as an example, and they're just like, those people are hypocrites and they're full of shit because of your example. I'm not getting on you to be perfect because I know I'm not and I know there's a lot of opportunities that I've foundered myself. When I make these videos, I feel convicted. I, you know, you point the finger at anybody, there's three, three more pointing back at you, right? So don't think I'm sitting here on a pedestal shaking my finger at you. Me getting on you is way of getting on myself too. I'm going to come over. And then it talks a bit about being a hypocrite here. But let's come over here. There's a couple of things I wanted to bring up in Second Peter chapter 2. 
it's interesting is that there's a lot of things that he's saying here that's like almost the same exact idea that we read from Jude. And there's a lot of different things that come up uh, that Paul speaks about. But the first little part I want to focus on is the first paragraph here, verses 1 through 3. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, that's basically flattery, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So here we see about false prophets, false teachers coming in, bringing in damnable heresies. And with their flatteries, they make merchandise of us. How do they make merchandise of us? Well, they try to make tithing some kind of New Testament law and then guilt trip you into all that. That's one of the main ways. Another way would be to buying their books. Another way is saying that if you would donate to them, that God will bless you like tenfold. There's some kind of prosperity gospel like that. You got to give money to get money, kind of thing. They do all these different BS crap to get money out of you. Like the Catholic Church will sell indulgences. You can pay to get your sins forgiven and stuff like that. It's just different things they do to bullshit you into giving you up your money. When Paul says if they want the money, they work with their own hands, right? Talking about the, the bishops, the pastors there. He, he set the example, being a tent maker, right? So if you're in want or if you're in need, work with your own hands. Anybody who's trying to get money out of you, guilting you into giving money like i encourage you to actually give money but to uh, wherever you feel convicted to do so to missionary stuff i put in my info box uh, feed my sheep which is a charity i like to uh, donate to to help out uh, with bibles and food and whatnot sending out to uh, nations around the world so that they can get the gospel and that uh, they can know that God cares about them. But if people are guilting you out of the, your money to support them, or if they're just using you to sell what they want to sell to make money, no, they he don't they don't don't do that. Don't support these kind of people. You see how they they bring in damnable heresies, and there's two things that these people are teaching these dim old heresies so that the way of truth is evil spoken of the one is saying that you're saved by grace through faith so you don't have to actually change your life you can just go do what you want and i'm starting to have the point of view of if you are actually saved you actually believe the gospel you're going to end up changing, becoming less worldly and more selfless, and people are going to know you're a Christian. You're going to produce fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, like we see in Galatians chapter 5, where we have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That kind of stuff is going to start to come out of you. Now, I'm not going to say it comes out instantaneously, and I'm not going to say it's going to come out within a, a week, month, year. You know, People come along at different times, but they need to be coming along. And if they just walk away, maybe they're getting pruned, right? I'm not going to say that people are lost, but if there's nothing coming from you, I'm not going to lie. I doubt whether you 
truly believe. Uh, but I also tell myself that I could be a late bloomer, need to get pruned, you know, maybe need a little bit more manure in the soil or something, right? A little bit of the humility there, having to use shit to grow, right? But anyway, uh, so these people would say that, oh, since you're saved by grace through faith, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's even like an example would be like Donnie B is basically saying that you're saved by grace through faith through the tribulation and through what's to come in the revelation. But the mark of the beast is coming. And if you take that mark, you are lost. You're not saved by grace through faith when that happens. If you take that mark, you are damned. But you see how it's a damnable heresy? It's a lie. So that it's like they're mixing it together. Right? Where at this time that Peter's talking about, they would teach this lawlessness. I can't remember exactly the term used, but they basically say, you know, you're saved by grace through faith, so we can just give in to anything. We don't have to fight our flesh. And that's what they would do. Sometimes it would be like so crazy that they were doing orgies and all this wine and drugs at these parties that would be their gathering at church it got really crazy and uh the other heresy sounds like my voice started to go again is that <clears throat> some of the connection we see going on here is with paul's writings the damnable heresy of you gotta keep the law that's another way how they're getting ties out of people is they they try to bring back the old testament Law and the Old Testament priesthood separating the clergy from the laity when we're all a priesthood and trying to put themselves above you so that you have to support them while they don't have to do any work whatsoever. Um, not saying it's wrong to help out if you feel like giving money, but if your pastor really gets on people about this kind of thing, there's something wrong. Something very wrong. But anyway. Uh, there was a couple of things I think down here in the video with I think at verse 15 we kind of see the same thing being talked about with Jude like we, we see it right here where he's talking about God not sparing the angels which sinned and cast them down to hell in the chains of darkness, just as Sodom and Gomorrah was overthrown as an example of all those who live ungodly. This is just like in Jude, verses 6 and through 7, I think, there, where it talks about the angels being in everlasting chains on a darkness unto the judgment of the great day, and uh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. We see the exact thing, same thing being said. And then uh, he talks about them going after the way of Cain and going after the way of Balaam. And here Peter's talking about the same thing. He says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And here is exactly what we see with a lot of churchianity. Balaam was trying to make money cursing God's people. So he was taking money to try to curse them. And since he couldn't curse them because God's blessed them, he took the money and encouraged them to sin. Because if we sinned, God would chastise us. And that's how we would be cursed. He would bring in worldliness. And that's where we are, the Laodicean church, lukewarm, worldly, and these church leaders are like Balaam making money off of it. They're worldly themselves. And 
That's why they make wages off of unrighteousness. And then they have to have a dumbass like myself rebuke them so that they can eat some humble pie. But, uh, yeah. Do good. Be an example. Be an example. Thanks for watching and take care.